Welcome everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the South by Southwest Future of Food panel around Winter Storm Uri, the Austin disaster and community response. My name is Jenny Stone and I will be moderating today's event and I'm joined by five amazing leaders from the Austin community who will share their experience and insights responding to and stabilizing our community during last month's historic weather event. So let's get to introductions. Valerie, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the role you played during the winter event? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I'm Valerie Ward. I'm the interim executive director for Good Work Austin. It's a nonprofit that was formed a couple of years ago to support small businesses in doing the right thing by their staff and their community and their planet. Um, it, in early um, spring of last year, uh, we became kind of a food response organization um, because of COVID. And since so many restaurants were out of work, and so many people needed food. Um, we organized to take programs that fed underserved populations, give that work to restaurants who needed the work and were paying their staff a living wage, and then continued that work in response to um, Yuri as that need increased. Awesome. Joy, you're up next. Tell us about yourself and the role you played. Awesome. Hello, everybody. I am Joy Chevalier, and I am the owner of the Cook's Nook here in Austin. And uh, yeah, the Cook's Nook is a culinary incubator. So we work with entrepreneurs, uh, we work with corporate brands, and we also have a food services group. And um, as of early uh, in the pandemic, uh, we in our food services group began working uh, a program called Keep Austin Together, uh, which on behalf of Travis County, um, also uh, feeds um, those in uh, Travis County who are suffering from food insecurity. And during the uh, winter storm URI, um, we continued that also uh, working with uh, oh, the EOC and other, other organizations like CRT and Good Work Austin uh, did our best to uh, continue feeding those who were new to the sudden uh, chronic food insecurity that happened that week and continuing onwards from that. So that's what we do. And I'm also on the board of the uh, Austin Travis County uh, Food Policy Board. So, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Joy. Edwin Marty. Hey, thanks so much. I'm the Food Policy Manager for the City of Austin's Office of Sustainability and delighted to join these great folks on the panel today. Uh, my day job is to help the City of Austin think strategically about its role within the food system. Um, we have uh, some aspirations to improve our food system, to create a more sustainable, more equitable, and more um, local food system. And the municipal government is exploring how to be a, an active part in both the implementation of that vision and the creation of a, a broader vision. Uh, since March 11, 2020, I've been pulled into the Emergency Operations Center's response to the COVID-19 pandemic regarding improving access to food for the community um, during the pandemic. And then the last couple of weeks here in Austin have been working on the Winter Storm URI uh, Emergency Operations Center's mass care unit, uh, trying to make sure that we're working on getting uh, appropriate amounts of food and quality food to everyone in the community. Um, so that's my day job and happy to be here. Thanks. Thanks, Edwin. Christina. Yes, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sister Christina Mohammed. I am the coordinator for the 10,000 fearless first responders. And our role in the snow that, and you know, or we call it the winter storm, right? Um, so we, a lot of times when we get into crisis, we look for people to come out and find where the resources are, where our jobs are to make sure that we go in and find those people who cannot maneuver and can't find the resources, but we bring it to them. So this part of the time we used it, um, food. We went out and found whatever good food there was, right? Not just something in a box, not something unhealthy just for somebody to eat, but to find some good healthy food during a time of disaster. Um, that's our role that we played. So thank, thank you so much for asking to have. Thank you. Um, last but not least, Ruben Cantu. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ruben, and I am the executive director of the Office of Inclusive Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the University of Texas at Austin. And um, the role that we played, or uh, I helped support in convening a community of leaders um, to help address where the missing gaps were 
within the uh, the snowstorm. And uh, this was not done solely by me, but by a larger collective of organizations who really came together. Sister Christina Muhammad really needs to be recognized for really being her and her team on the ground, doing the good work and um, making sure day in, day out, like she's still out there, the storm has been done and uh, she still has people in boots on the ground. So it's people like her that we need to recognize. So I was just a help conduit of helping bring people together. Thanks Ruben. Christina's on the ro road right now, I think still working. Right now? I mean, that says it all, I think, about her commitment. <laughs> well, thank you all so That's much right. for all the for introducing yourself and joining us. Um, before we jump into the questions, I wanted to provide a high-level overview of the winter storm event to set the stage for our discussion, especially because many people may be joining us from outside the Austin area. So in mid-February, Austin experienced a historic record-breaking freeze and snow event that shut down the city in the middle of another historic event, the COVID-19 pandemic. Power was out for multiple days and even as long as weeks for others, critical city and community services were stopped, schools closed, as well as commercial facilities, including restaurants and bars. Supply chains were disrupted and stores were emptied of food and water. Our water system eventually deteriorated, resulting in water loss to critical facilities, homes and businesses. And even though so many um, in so many cases, we lost water. Many experienced significant, significant water damage to their property. Still today, our community is working to repair and in some cases, completely rebuild. I'm sure I missed something, but hoping that's enough detail to set the stage. Um, so jumping in um, to our questions for today, um, Christine, I'm gonna go straight to you. Um, what were the big food planning and response um, capability gaps that you saw um, during the winter event? Um, excellent question. You know, when we talk about gaps, that's, I've worked several different disaster storms. That's what we do. We're always finding ourselves, wherever disasters are, we'll go in and we help. But one of the biggest things that I actually um, found was the quality of food. And I will say the interesting part, I remember working um, California wildfires. And the interesting part was that the quality of food that was available to those residents, I remember going through some of the bananas. And this is how this is how real it is, you all. Some of the bananas that were there, if you found one little brown mark on a banana, that was not qualified good food for the residents, right? So this was in our rich. We were working that particular location. It was for the rich people. And you know, I noticed here in this particular part, we did the best that we could. We went out and found some wonderful resources, working with the Cooks Look. Awesome, wonderful, a lot of these cook place, um, places. But one thing that I started noticing was MREs. Everybody was, where can we get MREs? Get MREs to our people. Well, if we really did a really good research and background where MREs are, that's not healthy food. Mm -hmm. It's not healthy. And just because you're going through a disaster don't necessarily mean a person has to survive like it's their last days. That was huge for me. And any of the disasters that I worked when I found that out, it was very sad to me. And I started going into the communities and that made me work a little faster. So wherever the MREs, I knew they were coming, I would beat the MREs there. I'm looking for fresh <laughs> fruit, fresh vegetables, right? I'm looking yeah. for the cooks, like, where's the food? Where's the good, warm, the good gourmet food? That's the food that the people and the children needed. And that's yeah. what I went to find. So that's a really big gap that I, I realized. In this yeah, event. I think that's a really good point. You know, it was during a really cold time and comfort food's important. And MREs remind me of astronaut food. Now I've never been to space, but that's what it's like. And it's in a box and it's that's for, right. you know, really for soldiers, right? And, and when they're yes. out and they can't get to a stove and a kitchen. Um, so that, yes. that really resonates with me. Joy, do you have any other gaps that you really saw that kind of maybe surprised you that you want to share and add on to what Christina's sharing? Yeah, I think mine, you know, especially being a part of the policy board, I think mine really come to that systemic planning, knowing that, you know, as a municipality, as a county, as those where we have structured systems, what is the responsibility to your community? What is that response? What does the plan look like? What does resilience look like? Um, you know, we live on a planet and things are going to happen, you know. Um, 
what does it look like when you know that you have to have emergency response? Um, what does the food plan look like? What does the water plan look like? If you're going to open shelters, if you're going to open warming centers, if you're going to have uh, facilities uh, for hurricanes or you know for storm management, um, and you're going to have to evacuate whether it's your unhoused population or those who may be having uh, water, gas, electrical issues, and they must evacuate their homes for whatever reason, you know you're going to have those scenarios and you're going to have to have people together. And that means you're going to have to have sanitation plans. Uh, and that means that you're going to have to have food plans and you're going to have to have water plans and you need to have those playbooks and they should already exist. And we clearly did not have that here. That did not exist. That did not happen. And nothing could be referred to. There was no marshalling of forces. There was no assignment even to the community or to business to say, here's a role that you can play under this scenario. Think of it as the Conservation Corps, you know, that you already have a function that you can serve if you're called to duty. And in extreme scenario, when we've even passed the playbook, Right. Yeah. Uh, this is what you can do to help. Or we know where those resources are in a sector. And so we found ourselves in a situation where you didn't even have the basic playbook. You didn't have the extended playbook, nor did the individuals even know where the resources lie, the basic resources lie. You know, what is the role in a sector that even provides you food and water, a sector that's already decimated under COVID? It's labor, it's decimated, it's businesses are hanging in, right? Um, and they're the ones you're gonna have to go to first. And that never crossed anyone's mind. And that, that to me is extremely disturbing, extremely yeah. disturbing. That's not just lack of planning. That to me is negligent. Yeah, yeah, I know Joy, you and I talked about this. And um, I think, there, when we get around towards the end of the session, I'm really interested in hearing some of your recommendations, right? And, you know, you have some strong feelings about moving forward and next steps. Um, so can we talk about those communities affected? Because I think, you know, one thing about this event was it wasn't discriminating in the sense that all communities lost some level of service, but we can all say that certain communities were most vulnerable and most impacted by this. And, and, and Ruben, can you, can you talk about that from your experiences and your perspective? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so as a, everyone knows, or, or as you get to know me, you'll know that I'm proud to be East Austinite, native East Austinite for that matter. Um, so that's the community that we try to really focus on. Those who are still living here, who are usually uh, below the poverty line, we try to figure out how we help provide and fill in the gaps for those communities similar to what Christina Muhammad is doing. Um, one of the things that people forget about in this uh, landscape of East Austin as it's being gentrified is that there is a strong um, mobile home community um, within the Eastern Crescent that uh, was overlooked, um, whose pipes busted and whose landlords were not being responsive enough to try to get them. So you have families who are living there and some of them who may not be fully, um, I guess they're, they're undocumented and they don't have the rights and the um, resources to be able to advocate for them. And so we had our team and some of our friends go out there and try to fill in the gaps. So we needed to be mindful of them because often we think about, you know, uh, the, the people who have the resources, apartment complexes, et cetera, and these people usually went without. Secondly, because I work in the student community, I checked in with my students and a lot of the students that we work with, some of them are were lucky enough to live on West Campus and they, they felt the brunt of it, but there's even more of them that live in East Austin in East Riverside. And when the HEB close to them was uh, not stocked and they were stuck and they, they, they lost heat and lost power, they had nowhere to go. And so we need to also be mindful of our student population and uh, the issues that they were going through through this process. So those are two that really stuck out. Finally, um, our unhoused community, I think as last count officially, we have about 2,500 uh, unhoused um, you know, neighbors uh, on the streets, but I think unofficially probably close to seven to 8,000 from the figure that I received, mm -hmm. uh, th th they were largely impacted as well. And so we need to also think about when we start thinking about the well-being of the entire community, uh, who are the people who are often forgotten about or, or fall between the cracks 
this is, if we want to build a stronger community, we need to be focusing on those that we often don't see or we choose not to see because it's very inconvenient or uncomfortable. So that's yeah. the kind of communities that I saw that were being affected. Yeah, thanks so much, Ruben. Edwin, um, being from the city of Austin, I'd love to hear your perspective about the communities, the different communities and their impacts and, and what you saw. Yeah, it's a complicated equation. Um, you know, pre-COVID-19 pandemic, we had pretty substantial food insecurity rates across the city, which is somewhat stunning because Austin is a very affluent city, you know, constantly rated as one of the best cities in the country, if not the world, with, you know, pretty high meat and family incomes. But we were still hovering at a well above a national average of food insecurity before COVID. Um, which is an indicator of some pretty significant structural systemic issues, structural racism being probably first and foremost, but some, um, some pretty specific inequities in our economic structure. So even before COVID, you know, there were a vast swaths of our community that were struggling just to survive on a day-to-day -day basis. Specifically, I would say the undocumented population, basically all the people that are building all of our beautiful skyscrapers downtown and harvesting all the food um, in our local farming communities, um, very heavily impacted by existing food insecurity before COVID. And then COVID hit and it, all it did was it just um, perpetuated and exacerbated all of those inequities. Um, and it made it a lot harder to address those. Um, we couldn't do congregate feeding during COVID, which is the mm -hmm. normal response to food insecurity, especially during a disaster, bringing people together. It's a very efficient way to feed people. Uh, but when you have a pandemic, you can't do congregate feeding. You have to figure out other models. And so lots of folks on this panel have been very involved with the incredible and creative responses to getting around that challenge. Um, and so then fast forward to the last couple of weeks here in Austin with the winter weather disaster, um, you've got the same issues with not being able to bring people together to provide congregate feeding. Um, you know, as Ruben touched on, significant unhoused population um, bringing them together in a, in a warming shelter uh, was deeply problematic um, from a, a COVID-19 um, infectious disease spreading perspective. So, um, you know, the unhoused population, certainly probably the most impacted, undocumented um, immigrants radically impacted, um, but then just the existing food insecure communities across primarily East Austin, Southeast Austin, um, East Austin, Northeast Austin, um, the folks that are really struggling, to, in the best of days, struggling to pay rent and, you know, pay the car payment and figure out what's left to pay for food. So those are unfortunately knowns. Um, we know that disasters make it so much worse for those communities. And I think we've got a lot of lessons learned in terms of how to be, uh, as Joy touched on, a little bit more thoughtful about what's in our existing plans and what needs to be in those plans. And to Sister Christine, um, you know, food is not a monolith. It's not a thing. It's different than water. Like water is a thing and you get it either bottled or you get it from the tap. Food is not a thing like that. It is a complex and diverse thing. And the food needs of communities differ radically from one house to the next house. We know that, you know, we have incredibly high levels of diabetic uh, community members or pre-diabetic community members across Austin. Um, the vast majority of the food insecure community in Austin is diabetic or pre-diabetic. And yet, to Sister Christina's point, you know, we're handing out these MREs, which I'll take full responsibility for, you know, as my job to get the food out, whatever food we can. And yet those are completely inappropriate for um, somebody who's really struggling with managing diabetes. So we've got a lot of lessons learned in sort of how to address the underlying systemic issues that continue to plague us and how to be more responsive and thoughtful about creating a, a, a more diverse uh, supply chain. Yeah. Hey, Jenny. Thanks. Yeah, sure. If you don't mind, I'd like to add on another two, two other quick groups. Um, I always want to bring up our elderly population and I will tie our elderly population and their access to food also with those who don't may not have transportation um, as well, because not only were they unable to go anywhere or act, access anything, but if they are also complicated uh, by the power and water and gas loss, then they also could not even work with anything they had in their own home. Right. Um, right. And and so that 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 population was beyond compromised. Yeah. No, Valerie, I want to get your voice in here. Can you can you react to all the discussion so far? And 
do you have anything to add on any of the any of the things we've been discussing? Yeah, um, I just want to recognize all the amazing work that all the people here have been doing and just reiterate that the thing that we learned through COVID and then even more through Storm Uri is how much of a need there already was that was going unmet and that people were already falling through the cracks or just barely making it and then not making it as soon as something tipped just a little bit further against their favor. Um, and I know that with Good Work Austin, we've been really addressing kind of people who are already within the system, feeding people who are staying at the pro lodges, people who are already in systems, organizations and programs that address food insecurity. But the biggest need that we saw that we were not able to meet because of our system was just people who needed food. And they're not in a program, they're not living in a facility, they're just people who need food and they're not connected to the resources and they weren't getting the information about where those resources were available in an emergency. And I think that's exactly. a huge gap. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's a huge one. Absolutely. Um, so one of the things I wanted to do is uh, there's a lot that we know we need to build off of, but there were some really good heroic silver lining stories, right? And I know that we were all proud to be a part of the Austin community um, and a lot of people I hear talking about to be reminded of um, neighbors helping neighbors and, and, and kind of, you know, maybe why, why we choose to live in Austin, right? And so can we share some of those stories? Um, Christina, do you, do you have a silver lining story that you want to share? And anybody else after Christina, please jump in. I just think the whole, I mean, the whole entire event, the disaster event, you saw neighbors, you saw people saying, I'm not a first responder, but hey, I, I had texts galore. I'm making a big pot of beans and a big thing of rice. Where can I drop it off at? Everybody wants to help. And, you know, just, I'll just go ahead and start with this particular um, situation that I'm in now currently, which is so beautiful, is again, we're here at Mount Carmel. And of course we know that due to the snow, you know, they're still being affected. The gas line is out and neighbors, I'm seeing people bring in food and my team is here and we're getting ready to get them out of here and put them into hotels. You know, it's just the fact of saying that I know this is where it's hard for you to live. You can't live properly. So how can we pull together as a neighbor? Food is everywhere. And just to let you know from the cook's look, some of your food is out here. You know, people, everybody on this call, the work that we're doing is absolutely wonderful. We just take the resources that we are being able to, to use, pull them out together and bring our resources to people that need it most. So when I got here, it was kind of people standing around with frowns, you know, I'm waiting on food to come. Where is it? And then, you know, we showed up with these big boxes of food. And it's like, whoa, there's the food. You know, where can we get the food? And it's just beautiful to be able to see the smiles on people's faces. So you're right, there is silver linings. There's a whole bunch more of those stories, but I just wanted to share that one. I love it. I'm currently sitting here now. So thank you so much again. Uh, oh yeah, that's wonderful. Valerie, I know you probably have some stories too. Please share. Yeah. Um I think, you know, it's sometimes the darkest moments are what shine the light on what we do have. And I think not only on the needs, but on the resources that are available and how much people can do. Um, you know, we, we're always working to get more businesses involved with Good Work Austin and share resources. And we brought in a lot of restaurants that hadn't heard of us, didn't know what we were doing, and were able to provide thousands and thousands of meals for people in need um, at the same time that we could provide funding for them to support their staff and their employees. Uh, and I think that's just amazing. And I think this really showed us that there is a need for government and government has a role, especially in coordination and communication and planning, but there's also a need. And I think it's absolutely appropriate for businesses and community groups to be involved in these plans as well. It shouldn't just be a monolithic government response and that can't be the response. It has to be a mutually supportive, integrated community response. And I think Joy has been doing some really great work around that. And I'm really excited about what's coming out of that. That's awesome. Anybody else wanna share a, a silver lining story before we go into problem solving? Uh, I want to recognize uh, two organizations that really worked hard to try to get our unhoused neighbors, um, well, a couple of them, uh, off, the, off the street. Um, first and foremost, uh, the Other Ones Foundation um, mm -hmm. for them 
deploying their fleet of vans and getting people mobilized. Um, Survive to Thrive, who helped uh, coordinate and liaise with the Austin Hotel Lodging Association, a series of hotels. And then Austin, um, Austin Mutual Aid, who yeah. I think a last count uh, collectively with Survive to Thrive, ha- housed about over 400 or more unhoused, um, unsheltered people that live on the streets. Um, these are the these are the heroic things that people did. Um, one of the one of the people that I like to highlight, um, aside from Sister Christina Mohammed, is this young lady. Her name is Nika, and Nika yeah, lives down the street and comes from Mason Manor, and she loves her community. And she was out there in the middle of the night before the storm hit, and was driving vans and picking people up uh, under bridges and um, getting them to safety and to shelter. And uh, all while being a mom at the same time, uh, it's people like mm-hmm. Nika who are doing this out of the goodness of the heart, just like Sister Christina Muhammad, who are boots on the ground, who love their community, who will give everything that they have to make, make a difference, uh, who, really, who really came through. I'd like to recognize her and also Fatima Mann, um, who also came all the way from Louisiana back in to just help mobilize and prop up or uh, the, the millennium uh, with my friend Jeff and Ray uh, to, to do this great work that uh, did to help distribute water and food to the community. Yeah, thank you so much, Ruben. And, and you know, we'll always need people like that, no matter, even if our government gets stronger and builds more capability, right? We're still gonna always need um, additional resources supporting our government um, through NGOs uh, and nonprofits. So, okay, let's turn it. To- yeah, real quick. go ahead, Joy. I just say real quick, I just wanted to toss out there. One day uh, we got a, a phone call in the middle of the storm, super icy night on Tuesday. And uh, we dragged into the, the cook's nook that day and, and made a set of meals to go out. And um, I, um, you know, no one was out Tuesday night. And I basically said, look, we, we really needed some folks to come help us. And we had a crowd of uh volunteers who uh, got mobilized from Adern, who came um, came in literally that afternoon and stayed with us um, <clears throat> out of the network who were older and came in from Cedar Park and mm-hmm. literally taught them <laughs> to mask and glove and taught them how to put food into containers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we ended up here way too late in the middle of ice and we had to send them home, but they were troopers and they were willing to stay as long as we did and we, we, we shipped them out. And so they were very kind and learned a lot. And, uh, and when uh, we sent them home, um, we had some guys from ELC Ops come in, turned out that they were actually the guys who do my recycling. And <laughs> <laughs> oddly enough, and we masked them up and taught them how to, and, and, and gloved them up and taught them how to package meals and got out 1500 meals that night uh, that went to the shelters. They were fantastic. Yeah. You know, I think in this event, you know, we weren't used to this type of weather in Austin. So for volunteers to step up when they themselves and we all felt vulnerable and scared, yeah. that's a really big deal. It was huge. Um, um, well, I'm so thankful. Oh, Ruben, do you have something to add? Just want to recognize Austin EMS. Yeah. Um, oh yes. Because they were working thirty-hour shifts, not just twenty-four sure. hours, thirty-hour shifts. And if we didn't know that they were, we we helped make sure that they got food. But yeah. the, the, they were working around the clock, and they were they were losing their trucks because they were stuck in the snow or they were oh. sliding. They just kept it together, and I just want to recognize Austin. They EMS. definitely were awesome. They came by and got boxes of food, and we fed them, and they were they were amazing. Yeah. And, and you know, yeah. I mean, they stayed calm, cool, and collected. You know, um, there are a lot of people out on the road that shouldn't have been out on the road Should doing crazy things, out. and yeah. they just were calmly just getting people on their way. Um, yeah. And so it was. I, I witnessed a number of events like that. And it was amazing. Well, thank you guys so much for sharing those good news stories. And now let's just shift a little bit and talk about how we're going to build back stronger. Um, and be more resilient as a community. And so I'd love to, um, each of you, and I'm just gonna go in order of the faces on my screen to share something that you yourself know that you're gonna do differently within your organization to be better prepared next time. And then kind of a recommendation for the community at large. And so 
Valerie, I see you first. So could you please share your, you know, what you think? Um, yeah, I think for us, um, just the thing that we weren't expecting was just how great the need was, um, but also being surprised at how many people were ready and willing to help. And so just kind of gathering those resources more ahead of time and being ready and really strengthening the, the network and the organization of being able to distribute those resources is what we're going to be working on. Awesome. It's like your bench. You're going to get your bench strength up, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, do you have something for the community that you hope that you see kind of like the call to action for all of us to work collectively on? Yeah, I think just really realizing that um, the, the lesson I keep learning over and over in the past year is that it's about solidarity and not charity and that we are all interconnected and we all help each other. It's not just about government taking care of citizens or rich people donating to poor people. It's really an interconnected, mutually supportive community that keeps us strong. And people want to be part of that. People want to give and receive and be part of that connection. And that's really what makes us strong as a city. Yeah, thank you. Um, Edwin, you're next. Um, um, let's see. Um, I think going back to what I mentioned earlier, we've been working on this thing called the Good Food Purchasing Program, which is a values-based um, institutional food procurement lens. It's sort of like LEED certification, but for food. I've been working on it for a couple of years. The Austin Independent School District had signed on as a, a, that as a policy for their food procurement. Um, and it's an interesting thing to think about um, integrating values-based procurement into emergency response. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't have something in the plan that recognizes that food is not a monolith, we're going to get monolithic food in response. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of a twofold, like part of my job is to do some creative thinking about how to get uh, values-based procurement integrated into emergency food response, emergency response specifically for food access. And then it's a call to action. Um, you know, in a couple weeks, we're gonna be hot and dry here in Austin and we'll all have forgotten this disaster, but our elected officials need to know that values-based procurement, AKA quality food for community members needs to be integrated into plans. And the reason I say that is because Values-based procurement is essentially saying we need to spend more money on our food. Yeah. Um, we have a, a you know a private sector supply chain that's based on um, basically on-demand food. We have three days of food in our grocery store very intentionally because it's profitable for grocery stores to be able to flip their entire inventory every three days, and it's amazing. It's great as long as everything's working good. It's awesome, but as soon as something stops working, it's perhaps irrational as a community for us to base our well-being on an on-demand, for-profit, in my opinion, fragile supply chain. Right. Is there a role for a municipal government to create an alternative or an additional supply chain that has built into it resilience and that is not based on the simple concept of profitability but instead is based on the concept of appropriate quality. Um, so my hope, and this is what I'll be focused on for quite some time is how do we integrate that? Recognizing that it's gonna cost more money. MREs are really cheap and they yeah. last for a really long time and they're very standardized and you put them on a box and you know how many are in the box and you know how many boxes are on the pallets and you know how many pallets fit into a, you know, a 18 wheeler we don't have to rely on that mentality to feed our community in the future. But to do that, we have to have voices advocating to the people who get to make the decisions, the hard decisions about how we as a community spend our money. So that's my call to action. Thank and you I, so much. And I just wanna add on to what Edwin was saying that I think when we do invest locally, in providing quality food, we get returns because it doesn't go to some monolithic corporation. The money right. stays in the community, it creates jobs, it supports local farmers, and it can come back um, several fold what we put so in. So it's, it's a different type of investment, even though it costs something, you're investing in the community. I believe so, yeah. That's awesome. Joy, you're up next. Uh, 
Well, uh, I think mine is a continuation of Edwin's, but it's the it's the other side of that, and that is to be to continue to be that advocate for a resiliency planning. And what does that and what does that look like on both sides of the fence? In order for Edwin to do what he needs to do, that we have to, from business and from community, must be able to um, advocate successfully on our side to say and demand um, real, 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 uh, a, a means first of uh, first off for us to be able to do the appropriate outreach to be able to say. Uh, what is that resilience planning? What do we need? What are we able to offer? What are we able to do um, from a business standpoint and prepare ourselves to do those things? Um, you know, what does it mean for us to have those networks um, and to map those and provide that data and what our roles can be so that these, these, these plans can actually be laid in? What are our, our recommendations into that? Um, and basically say, I don't think that sometimes they know what we're all capable of doing <laughs> from a community standpoint or from a business standpoint. Um, and so I think we're going to have to tell them um, yeah. this is what we're capable of, all, what we're both sides yeah. of us capable of doing. Yeah. Um, and we need you to put us into those and, and, and have you put us into those plans. Um, I think we've shown that over the last, the last couple of weeks. And I think uh, government has been surprised and we need them not to be surprised. <laughs> um, and they need to go write that playbook. <laughs> yeah. So you need to go write your playbook now that you know what the rest of us are capable of doing. Yeah, um, you can depend and, on us. When and the depend time on comes. us to be able to deliver yeah. um, and, and, and help them be able to, to, to write that. So whether that's continuing our own conference that we've had on resiliency or helping them to go write those documents, whatever those may be, out of the food policy board or some community effort to do that, but they have to get done. Something has to be generated um, at this point because it's pretty ridiculous that what's going to be the 10th largest city in the United States does not have these items. Right. It's very simple. Right. And then that, that I think will lead then to the quality conversation of what is in the playbook and the right. quality of food and the quality of that response to get to Sister Christina and, and Edwin's conversation. Thank you so much, Joy. Um, Sister Christina, what you, anything that you learned that yes, you're gonna do differently and what, what your recommendation and hope for is for our whole community? Well, you know, um, for myself, you all, I'm a community emergency response team. So disaster preparedness is kind of, that's the more role that we play. And what we teach and train people is how to can food. So we got to go back into the end. We got to look at self-accountability. That's first and foremost. If you can take care of yourself and your family, then you can help others. But if we're not taking accountability for ourselves, and that's where I want our role to be able to go in and teach and train the people. Everyone, how can you, not just how do you live for today, but you got to live for the next 30 days, the next 90 days, the next six months. So if anything was to happen, everyone needs to learn that you cannot depend solely on someone to come in and save you because people are doing the best and they're going to do the best that they can do at that particular moment. So I'm looking at training classes. We've got to have these classes in to start teaching people how to. Right, so we have our people who have maybe get food stamps and certain different um, things that they can bring in money to get food in. But how can I take that food and learn how to can? Mm -hmm. I should have a whole wall of nothing but canned goods where I don't have to worry about going to HEB, where I don't have to worry about standing in a line. I can can my own food for my own survival. So if anything was to happen, that's one thing that I didn't have to worry about. I didn't have to worry about going to none of these stores because I had enough food to take care and satisfy my family's needs. That's how I was able to go out and help people. A first responder has to be set, right? So we have yeah. to be first responders as a community. So what I would love to do, what we're going to do now is number one, I'm getting to these tables. I'm talking, I'm making sure that we have that plan. We're setting up a plan, but we have property that we use to teach and train our people, but we're going in and dropping some food. We're dropping some food in the ground. I'm talking about acreages and acreages. And we have 100 acres. We're mm -hmm. dropping food. We're dropping them seeds in the ground. And we're going to produce fresh vegetables, fresh food for our people and keep it going. So a yeah. disaster may come once or twice a year. 
But every single day, people live, black and brown people live in a disaster every single day. So we can focus on how do we help ourselves? How do we help the people every day versus once a time a disaster comes, then we got to rush and get the ball rolling and we're trying to scuffle for resources and do this, that, and the other. But if we can take it every single day, what can I do today to make tomorrow if a disaster happens? That has to be the mentality that we do. So then we can stop surviving and we can get to living. And right now, our people are in a survival mind frame and not living. That's a huge yeah. difference. That's the gap that I want to see. Yeah, change. that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, that individual preparedness is huge. Um, and we could talk all day also, because I'm sure you see generational differences between the different generations, you know, you know, the younger yeah. generations where they've yeah. had everything immediately with technology, you know, that's, the, we really have to do some training there about preparedness because yeah. they are used to getting yeah. things instantly. Um, you know, some of the older generations fared better, you know, because they had that mentality, they had lived in different times and were more patient and thoughtful about how to get ready for this. So uh, that's amazing that, that that's amazing work that you're doing. Um, so important. Uh, Thank you. Yes, um, and then last but not least, Ruben, cl- close us out. And we want to hear your recommendation, you know, that you're thinking about, uh, you know, within the t- spaces that you touch and then across the community, what you hope to see. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that opportunity. Uh, when we look at all of it, um, a network is only as strong as its connections. And um, in terms of pursuing work we do, yes, we need disaster planning. Yes, we need a resilience plan. We continue to work in silos, not some of us because we want to, it's just because we're knee deep in our work. We don't have time to be the hybrid and bridge for everything else. So one of the things that we can develop is making a commitment to understand who is left, who is right, who's up front, who's in the back, who's on top, who's on down, like get a real spatial organization. So if I need to know that we need boots on the ground, get uh, Sister Christina Muhammad on speed dial and like we can move and figure out like she's, she needs more help. She's like, hey, I need this. And we have this asset mapping and database to yeah. figure out what needs to happen. So it's not just understanding the assets. It's reinforcing and nurturing the trust within the synapses, within the nodes, so that when it's time to move, there's a clear understanding. Uh, We saw this more evident here in this this winter storm than any time before, where we had a lot of people have to come together that never worked before together in the past, and they had to just roll up their sleeves and get to work. That trust and that, that ability to build and hold that space is critical to save lives. And so if I ask anyone, what are you gonna do? Start, start also thinking about what networks are you building and what, how, how can you bring networks together? Because the more we tie each other together, the more resilient we can, the more resilient we can be. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it, what are they, there's like a saying, it's you wanna meet people um, ahead of time before you show up and have to respond to a disaster together, right? To always be thinking ahead of time, what, what relationships do we need to build? So then when you show up, you can more quickly get to work and there's less friction. Um, Well, thank you guys so much. Anybody have any closing words before we close it out? I think we're close to time. Good. Thank you so much for joining us. um, And we look forward to continuing this discussion in other forums in Austin and beyond.